the bitterness of being bitter. Yeah, bitter. Bitterness, being bitter. This is a this is a very meat topic that I'd like you and I to discuss today. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and please follow me along in the scriptures that you and I are going to be looking at today, word for word, verse by verse in your authorized version, commonly called the King James Version. Yes, the bitterness of being bitter. What is what does it mean to be bitter? What is bitterness? Hmm? We're going to uh, we're going to look into this, and I, I got to tell you that this video has been brought about by very recent events that has transpired with my wife and I. Very recently, um, certain things have happened, and um, and recently I have been bitter. And been in bitterness. And uh, right now I want to I wanna confess a fault to all of you, my brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God, and even in the presence of my lovely enemies. Forgive me. I, I, I have been bitter lately. I have been bitter lately. Um, and there's no excuse. And I will not make one. Please forgive me, dear brethren, Church of the Living God, for being bitter. And being bitter, being in bitterness, or seeming to be in bitterness. Mm. Please forgive me. I repent of that. This is something that we all deal with, or, and some actually struggle with, being bitter. Before we go any further, though, let's... let's Get one thing out of the way. When we say, when I say to you, bitter, what's the first thing you usually think of, right? What? Ugh, that's bitter. Like bitter grapes, oh, lemon, you know, uh, take a bite off of a lemon. It's like, Ugh. Some will say, oh, that's sour. Eh. Things that are different are not the same. Sour and bitter, they are two different things. But bitter, we, we generally associate that with taste. And there is, there is um, absolutely bitter in taste. Also, there is something called bitters, which is something that they use uh, with alcoholic drinks. Okay? But we are not going to be addressing in Scripture today the bitterness or bitter of taste. Bitter taste, I should say. Okay? We're not going to address that, uh, go off on that. But we are going to address it. Go first to... Get your, uh, your scriptures, come on. Go first to is, uh, exis, yeah. Exodus. Thank you. <laughs> Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Okay. Let, let's get this one out of the way. This is not what we're going to be talking about or focusing on. Okay. We are going to utilize first mention here quite, a, quite profoundly. And we're going to see what bitterness is. As defined by Scripture. Because you can look, as I have, you can look in Mr. Webster's dictionary. Not too bad, of course. But we have to remember, brethren, what did they do before there was a dictionary? You, you tell me that God needed a dictionary, right? Uh, no, um, even even um, devils will confess and admit that God built within his word, the scriptures, its own dictionary of terms and words. Just got to look, okay? So, for the definition of these words, we are not going to be going to Mr. Webster. Again, I've got no problem with Mr. Webster. He has botched it a couple of times, yes. Not going to go there. We are going to find our definitions for these things right here, Jack. Okay? Right here. All right? But first and foremost, let's get this thing about as far as bitter taste out of the way. Okay? Exodus chapter 15. Follow me along. Okay? Follow me along. Exodus chapter 15, 
verses 23 on to... Um, 23 on to verse 25 in Exodus chapter 15. Follow me along. Bitter in taste. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Okay, this is not the first reference of bitter, by the way. But like I said, we're getting the thing of bitter taste out of the way first. We're not going to concentrate on that. But yes, Scripture does use the word bitter as this. Are you looking at that? Okay. They could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it, is, of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord shewed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made, there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So, yes, bitter. Something that's bitter in taste, okay? Yes, okay? Scripture uses the word bitter for bitter in taste. Yes, yes it does, okay? Also, we're not going to be looking at bitterly, okay? Go to Judges, okay? Go to Judges. We're going to look up at the first uh, reference of these words, okay? Go to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 5, come on. Judges chapter 5, also verse 23, okay? Judges chapter 5, verse 23. Look at this verse. Curse ye Meroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly. Curse bitterly. Bitterly, okay? In a bitter fashion. Curse them bitterly, okay? Bitterly, in a bitter fashion, with bitterness, okay? You could say, I guess. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because, why are they being bitterly cursed? Because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Mm. Okay? So, bitterly, Doing something bitterly. Whereas bitterness, what is bitterness? Let's look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, first reference here of bitterness. Okay? We're not going to be, we're going to be talking about bitterness, but in order to understand bitterness, we need to understand scripturally what it is to be bitter. And when we look into this, might surprise a few of you. Might surprise a few of you. Okay? First Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1. This is talking Hannah or Hannah. Okay? Hannah, the uh, mother of Samuel, the prophet and judge in uh, Israel. Okay? Before the anointing of King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 1, let's read verses 9 on to verse 10. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in, and she was in bitterness. First reference of the word bitterness right here. She was in bitterness of soul. Very interesting. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And why was she? Why did she weep sore? She didn't have a son. She didn't have the fruit of the womb. Okay. And her husband had another wife. Okay. She was sharing her husband. And the other a uh, woman there, she had children and would mock her and stuff like that. And then uh, Hannah's husband is like, am I not better to you than ten sons? Okay, kind of hurt himself by patting himself on the back, you know. But uh, she was in bitterness of soul because of not having, you know, the fruit of the womb or something. But 
What's to note here in verse 10 is how bitterness is used. And you will see as we look at the word bitterness, primarily in the New Testament, the word bitterness, but we're going to concentrate on bitter. Okay? To understand bitterness, we need to understand what scripturally bitter is. Okay? Yes. Bitter in taste. Yes. Already looked at that. Bitterly, kind of glanced at that. We're not focusing on that. Okay? But look at this again. And she was in bitterness. In bitterness. So one could probably be bitter but not be in bitterness. Mm. Interesting, isn't that? Look at that verse. And she was in bitterness of soul. Mm. Mm. At the time, she didn't have, a, have the fruit of the womb. She was mocked of her adversary, okay, for not having children. She was comforted by her husband. It's like, I'm better than ten sons. But if you were to continue reading, she vowed a vow unto the Lord. It's like, you give me fruit of the womb, a son, I'll give him back to you. Hence, Samuel, okay? So she was in bitterness because of the mockery of her adversary, her husband's other wife, okay, <laughs> boy, okay? But also that, not only in the mockery of that, but that fact that she was barren, okay? And hence, she was bitter, she had bitterness of soul, okay? So she was in bitterness because of barrenness and because of mockery, okay? So keep that in mind, because also bitterness will arise because sometimes you don't get things the way you want them or you don't get your way. And we see that Hannah, she, she finally got that fruit of the womb. And boy, what fruit it was, right? So that was, we looked at the first reference of bitterly and of bitterness. But it wasn't the first reference of bitter, okay? This might shock you, a shock a few of you. Go to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Something happened to us on Monday that was pretty, oh, not again. And it was, it was devastating to us both because number one, we weren't expecting it. And number two, we both were weren't instant in season. My wife and I both, we were not. And um, I was bitter that whole day. And of course, there have been some, I have been in, uh, in bitterness myself of late, unfortunately. And I, like I said, I confess that unto you. But when it comes to being bitter in bitterness, Genesis chapter 27, Note, now this is the first reference of bitter. Note the context and in the way the word bitter is being used. Okay? Genesis chapter 27, let us read from verses 30 on to verse 38. This is talking about Jacob and Esau. This is when Isaac said to Esau, hey, go get some venison. And make me venison that I like that I may bless thee. Then uh, Jacob's mother heard that and she said to Jacob, you go in there, okay? You let me make it for him and then you go get it, okay? And Jacob, the one who takes his brother by the heel, okay? That's the backstory, okay? That's the backstory. And also too, when, taught, when considering this, you have to also remember in... Um, in Genesis chapter 25, about how Esau sold his birthright for food. Because why? His God was his belly. Okay? So that's the backstory leading up to this. Okay? Esau was sent out to go get venison. Um, Jacob came in um, from making, you know, something that his mother had made. And he puts uh, skins on his wrists and on his neck and stuff like that to deceive his father. Okay, so that's the backstory. 
Genesis chapter 27, verses 30 on to verse 38. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Okay, Jacob came in, took the blessing. It was appointed of God because Esau sold his birthright. That's why God hated Esau. Okay, he hated Esau because he sold away his birthright. For food, his God was his belly, okay? That's why God hated Esau, all right? So Jacob comes in, takes away the blessing, as it was appointed by God, okay? Okay, so let's continue. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. That his soul may bless me. Hmm, interesting. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. See, at this point, they both knew what had happened. They both knew what had happened. And when Esau heard the words of his father, pay attention, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry. And said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. First appearance of the word bitter, right there. Look at the context in which it appears, okay? Now, let's, we mentioned this. Hold your place there and go to Genesis chapter 25. Why was it here? And when Esau heard the words of his father, because Isaac started trembling like, Oh no, oh no. I gave his my I gave his blessing away to someone else. Who is that someone else? But Jacob. Okay. Okay. So Isaac already gave his, uh, the blessing on to Jacob. Okay. Why was his cry so bitter? Genesis chapter twenty-five, verses twenty-nine, on to verse thirty-four. And Jacob saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and was and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, dramatic. Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do me? When you stop and think about that, what profit will this birthright do to me? Think about that. Look at what Jacob was, the one who took his brother by the heel, okay? Some will say supplanter, okay? But one, the one who took his brother by the heel, okay? Look at what Jacob was. And then with wrestling with God, Jacob became Israel, a prince with God and man, okay? So this birthright that Esau was questioning because he was at the point to die. Uh, obviously, <laughs> and what profit shall this birthright do to me? Oh, oh, quite a bit. And when you consider of Jacob himself, what he went through because he took that birthright, okay? He, he, the birthright was his. Okay, because Esau sold it away because he was hungry. His God was his belly. Okay, yeah, the birthright meant a lot, didn't it? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Oh, we can, we can go for about three, four hours on that, can't we? But... 
I'm going to leave that alone. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. I have fire here. And he did eat and drink. He didn't ask Jacob for anything to drink, did he? He just asked him for something to eat. Jacob's like, here, give you some soup here, some lentils, pottage. Here, here, go ahead, here. Have some, something to drink too. Go ahead, wash it down. Make sure, you know, you rinse your mouth out real good. Make sure it goes down good. You make sure you like it. Is it the season right for you, right? Yeah. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright because his God was his belly. Okay? Then it came time to inherit the blessing from Isaac. Jacob came in. Okay? The one who took his brother by the heel. Okay? And in a crafty subtlety, took it from him. Okay? It was ordained of God because Esau despised his birthright. And um, and here in also in uh, cha uh, chapter twenty seven, uh, verse twenty is very telling in uh, Genesis chapter twenty seven. Okay, verse twenty. And Isaac said unto his son, he was talking to Jacob, who was pretending to be Esau, because you think about it, it's like what? Oh boy, uh, Isaac must have been pretty stupid not to be able to discern his two sons, right? Verse twenty. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? Jacob right here says it. And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Why is that? Because he sought to spice his birthright. And when it came time for him to inherit that blessing, that birthright, verse 34, And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding Bitter cry. Ah! Bitter. Bitter. Because he knew he done messed up. I, I wonder. I wonder. If the, the scenario of him and that pottage was going through his mind. I bet you it was. I hope for his sake. I hope he remembered the flavor and the savoriness of it all. And how good the water or whatever it was he was that he drank was. Hmm? And when Esau heard that the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. See, he knew he done messed up. He knew it was he, he knew. By this time, he knew what that birthright was would mean to him. He knew then, didn't he? Didn't he? And he knew that he, there was no going back. That was done. He done messed it up. God hated Esau for this. God hated Esau because of that, for him selling his birthright because his God was his belly. And at this point, it's very safe to say that he got it. He would get the second hand, if you will. Great blessings from the Lord, yes. Our Lord made of Esau a mighty people, yes, he did. But of that line of the Jew, Esau wasn't in that line of the Jew. Even though he came descended from Isaac, because it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No Esau. Okay. Verse 35. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not his is he and he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? He's blaming Jacob. But in truth, in truth now. Now Jacob, of course, is like, Hey, sell me your birthright. Okay? 
But Esau, Esau was at fault. Jacob, of course, supplanter, okay? The one who took his brother by the heel, okay? That's what he does. He took his brother by the heel, okay? But Esau should have known better. What will this birthright do me? Everything. And in typical fashion, blaming someone else, even though he knew. In verse 34, with that bitter cry, even though he knew it was on his shoulders. Hence, bitter, being bitter. You know, deep down, You know deep down it's your fault. And that makes you bitter. Hence, that's why to cope with it, the woman that thou gavest me, she did give me of the tree and I did eat. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. That stings you, doesn't it? Good. Good. And Isaac answered and said unto him, unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. What shall I do now unto thee, my son? What else, what else was there to do? Huh? What else was there to do? And look at Esau. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Esau was a little bit more concerned about the blessing now, wasn't he? When he was entitled to it by right of birth. Kind of like Reuben, who was the firstborn but unstable as water, and defiled his uh, father's uh, couch, or bed, I believe it might be said. It might be couch. But defiled his, uh, his father's bed, okay? He was firstborn, and that firstborn, um, firstborn ship, if you want to call it, went to who? Joseph. Joseph was attributed as the firstborn, got the rights and privileges of that. But the lawgiver came from Judah, that interesting yeah and especially in the establishing of the line of the Jew the Hebrew Abraham Isaac and Jacob oh this was very important so yes obviously once he figured out once he knew oh I done messed up and there ain't no going back now it's like can I get anything I can out of you? Look at that. Look at that. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And we got to read to verse 40. I know I said to verse 38, but we got to read to verse 40. Okay. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, and picture it, okay? <laughs> Everything had been given to Jacob. Esau messed it up, okay? This was a mess up that there was no repentance to. Like those of you who have chosen to serve the Vatican and Satan and made yourselves permanent enemies of the church of the living God, of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, with all your heresies and all your uh, slander and all your nonsense that you do. See, you've gone past that point of no return because you've made your choice. Your God is your belly. You know, your God is your belly. Hence, you're bitter. And in bitterness. Because you chose otherwise. And that chance you had. God can save anybody. Yes, you can today. But when a man makes a choice 
to serve the devil and receives from his Father all things when you bow down and worship him. Oh, yes, brethren, there is definitely a point of no return with people. Not that God can't save for them. God can save anybody. He Look at what he did with Jacob. Okay? Look at what he did with you. Okay? Yes, our Lord can save anybody. But there are people, brethren, just like Esau, who will make their choice and choose their belly shall choose flesh. And I'm telling you, most people, when they make that choice, they're gone. They ain't no coming back. The Lord can save them. But see, there's a certain point in anybody that you will cross a line further you go, the harder it comes to get back there. Even if some of you were put on that sinking submarine, oh, you'd sure cry out. You, you'd be like he, he, you'd be like Esau. And Esau said unto his father, hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, oh my father. And I said, and Verse 39 on verse 40. Isaac, just picture it. It's like, what am I? Okay. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy, notice this, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. Now hold on. Hold up now. Hold up. The fatness of the earth. Esau, or Jacob, was given the blessings of heaven. Okay? Esau, his Lord was going to be who? Jacob. Isaac just said it. Okay? And everyone was going to serve Jacob. Okay? Jacob was of that line of the Hebrew. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Yes, Esau was Jacob's brother. Yes, but Esau was not a part of that line of the Hebrew. He was not. He was not. Prove me wrong, tough guy. Prove me wrong in Scripture. Okay? He was not, even though... See, okay? There are those that come from Shem, but they ain't Jews. They ain't Hebrews. Okay? They're Shemite. Okay? Like... Uh, the Chinese and the Japanese and stuff like that. They're Shemites. Shem. Okay? Yes, they are. They're Shemitic. But they're not Hebrews. See? Okay? And the blessing unto Jacob was from heaven. Yes, it was. But the blessing, what was left for good old Esau? Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. And of the dew of heaven from above. Note that. So, behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. And remember the curse upon the serpent. On your belly thou shalt go. Her ways are movable. Hi. And dust shalt thou eat. And we came from dust. And Satan doesn't favor the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Hello. Any wonder why Esau was a little bitter? Any wonder why some of these devils who attack us seem a little bitter? Hmm. Verse 40. And by thy sword, that's the sword of the Spirit, ain't the sword of the Spirit, and by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Hmm. Bitter. Want to see some bitterness now? We know why Esau is bitter, don't we? Brethren, 
We know why now some of these devils are very bitter. And when you think about it, when we, the Church of the Living God, when you, when me, hi, when we get bitter, it's usually why? Because we mess up. We mess up. What's different is today, we are of the Church of the Living God. There isn't a sin that our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, will not forgive us of, okay? If you belong unto him, you are of his body, you know, part of the church of the living God. He cannot deny himself. He can deny you a lot of things here if you deny him, like, you know, uh, not deny him, you, you know, he, he can't deny, he won't deny, excuse me, that. He won't deny you your salvation, okay? Once saved, always saved, okay? But there are many ways you can deny him out there in man, uh, in front of men and in the way you live. And he will deny you blessing, protection, providence, that kind of thing. But he will not deny himself, meaning once saved, always saved. But you can sure lose a lot. That's the difference because why we today, we are eternally secure. Esau didn't get what he wanted. Hence he was bitter. And verse 34, he knew. I, wa I wonder, again, I wonder if Esau could taste that red pottage and that bread and whatever it was he drank. I wonder if that taste came up in his mouth. You've heard the phrase with some people when something bad or what something happens, when they don't get the thing that they want or whatever, something goes awry and they say, ah, talking about sore, so oh, that situation, I got a bad taste in my mouth. Want to see some bitterness? Verse 41, little bitterness. Esau was bitter because he knew he had messed up. Okay, it was his fault. Of course, blaming Jacob. Jacob was at fault. But did Jacob? No. Here. Here. Some of your birthright. Here. Got, for, got this. Some of your birthright. All this will I give thee. If you fall down and worship me, all will be thine. Verse 41. And Esau hated Jacob, because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. What's verse 41? Oh, that we call bitterness. That we call bitterness. Because something didn't go the way Esau had expected or wanted it to. And then verse four, uh, 34, he realized, oh, it's, a, it's my fault. But uh, it's Jacob. Bitter. Genesis. Genesis. Uh, Genesis. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Verses 7 on to verse 14. Now, Israel is in Egypt. Israel is in Egypt. The king that knew Joseph, the good king, the good king who treated Joseph well. Okay? He's out the picture. Exodus chapter 1, verses 7 on to verse 14. By the way, we're not going to be looking at all 38 uh, appearances of the word bitter or all ver uh, 22 appearances of the word bitterness, okay? We're not going to be doing that, okay? Selected things here. Exodus chapter 1, verses 7 on to verse 14. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Hmm. This verse right here, which knew not Joseph, that, that's a telling kind of telling verse for me, kind of. You know what I mean? 
What? You, you didn't think these kings would communicate? You know, one going out and one coming in? Maybe the former king died before this uh, new king, this new pharaoh came up? We don't know. But he didn't know Joseph. And what came to mind immediately with that? Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. This came to mind. I'm just going to share this with you, okay? Just want to share this little uh, nugget with you. Because when I read that, uh, the, Lord's guided, the Lord guided me to this. I was like, huh. Hmm. I don't know if it's really pertinent for it, but this is what came to mind, okay? Judges chapter 2, verses 6 on to verse 10. Uh, verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Hmm. A new king. Didn't know how it used to be. Didn't look into the past to see how things were. Who are all these people? The good that they done for our nation. How they built all this stuff and that stuff. Hmm. Judges chapter 2 verses 6 on to verse 10. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Okay? I think you're figuring out why we're looking at this. Like I said, I'm just going to throw this piece for you out here. You nibble on it, okay? And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. And also, all that generation, all that generation, what's coming to your mind, brother, sister? Huh? Proverbs 30, right? Right, Proverbs 30. There is a generation that doth not bless their mother or their father, right? that are pure in their own eyes, who jaw teeth are knives, right? Well, I can think of a couple of these young whippersnappers who think they're, oh, oh, never mind, never mind about that. Never mind, we've got other things to talk about, okay? Okay, <laughs> never mind. Yes, and Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died, being 110 years old. Okay, we, are, we already read that. Okay, verse 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Hmm. Hmm. Go back to Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 again. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. You, you chew on that one for a little bit, okay? You chew on that. Just wanted to throw that at you. Let's continue. From verse 9 and on to verse 14. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies, and fight against us, and so get them out of the land. So this new Pharaoh, this new king, obviously was not aware or didn't care about how Israel had benefited his people and nation heretofore. Didn't care. But he saw the threat rather than the benefit. So, what does he do? Verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. <laughs> but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And you got to remember too about this. Well, let's read to verse 14. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. Okay? This tells us that before this new king, this new Pharaoh, wasn't like that. Okay? Wasn't like that. Something changed. 
other than just a new king came on the scene. And usually, and you can see this uh, uh, by example in many aspects of things, uh, when some like uh, you, those of you that are in secular workforces, you know, a new manager or a new someone comes on the scene, wants to be the hotshot, they're going to do things this way, we're going to change it all up, right? Usually that's just lighting a, lighting a wick for a little bomb to explode, you know, usually. But let's continue. Verse 14. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. So their lives were made bitter by this hot shot king, which we can liken onto a type of Satan. Okay. We've talked about this before. Okay. Comes up, wants to make an example, and is a skirt of the children of Israel. I believe, more rather, he doesn't want to acknowledge how Israel was a benefit and a blessing onto his people and nation, but rather saw the threat. So what does he do? He becomes a jerk and imposes all this stuff upon them. Okay? Force. And because of that, and they were made, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Mm. So their lives were made bitter, not necessarily because of what they were doing, but because of what they were being put through. Okay? Bitter. And they groaned unto the Lord. They, cry, they cried to God. In this bitterness, in being, uh, excuse me, in this uh, being bitter, okay? Being bitter. They cried unto God, okay? Okay? So, another aspect of being bitter is through what? Bondage. Hmm. You know how it says in Romans 6, I believe it is? Uh, hold your place here. Let's go there. Romans chapter 6. Roman, not the concordance, Brad. Boy, did you overshoot that one. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, okay, bondage. You know you're not saved, you're in bondage. Mm -hmm. Bondage to who? Satan. You devils, you coagulators, you're in bondage. Satan, okay. You're not, you don't have liberty. You don't have liberty at all. <laughs> but you know here in um, in Romans chapter 6, verse 21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There are some of you who are lost who realize that your life is bitter because you have a problem that you just can't cure. You have things in your life you just can't hate and you can't you you can't you've done this you've done this you've done this you've tried to change your life you might have changed your life but there's still that thing missing hence being a little bitter huh but and also too we got to remember this about what we just read here in exodus this was prophesied go to genesis chapter 15 okay this was prophesied this was fulfillment of prophecy okay Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 on to verse 14. Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 on to verse 14. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Not Abraham yet. He wasn't Abraham yet. Abram, okay? And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Note that the fulfillment of this was in Exodus. Okay? Okay? Prophecy being fulfilled. Okay? When God says something, that he's going to do something and bring something to pass, you can take it to the bank boy and hang a thousand bucklers on it. Okay? And he said unto Abram, uh, Genesis 15, verse 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Verse 14 is imperative. 
to understanding this. Because those of you out there, um, it's like, well, see, God, he's the author of evil, so it's God's fault. So it's God's fault, huh? There'll be a video in the description box if you have that attitude or that thought. Go ahead and watch that, okay? Won't get into it now. But, okay, verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall, they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Okay? So from verses, what was that? 12 on to verse 14, we read, we read verse 15, okay, obviously. But from verses 12 on to verse 15, that was prophecy fulfilled here in uh, the tale of the Exodus. And Abraham and Abram, who became Abraham, died in a good old age. And exactly this in Exodus. But see, they were made, their lives were made bitter because of bondage, okay? And, there, and some of you, it's like, you lost people. It's like, well, that was God's fault. But, ah, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go to Exodus chapter 9. Okay? God knows how to make a point. Can we agree on that at least? God knows how to really make a really good point. A point so good that even Esau got it. And by that time it was too late. Mm -hmm. Because think about it with Esau. <laughs> was Isaac that dense, that old? No. Like it says in and like it said in verse 20, the Lord thy God brought it me. Because Esau despised his birthright. Okay? God knows how to make a point. Especially those who don't want to believe the truth, who want who reject truth. Okay? God knows how to make a really good point. And Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. Uh, let's read verses 15 and 16. Now, excuse me, verses 14 out of verse 16. Talking about Pharaoh, Paul echoes this in the book of Romans. For I will, verses 14 on to verse 16. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee, and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up. Why? For to shew in thee my power, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now, before all this, obviously, in Exodus chapter 1, this Pharaoh had already had a hard heart, already was hardened. God just helped it along because why he already made his choice. So God chose him to make an example out of. Talk about that, and so it's God's fault, I believe, okay? God knows how to make a point, Okay? He did this, like it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. All things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. Hmm. I can constantly tell you, brethren, you're not reading the Old Testament. You're crippling yourself. You're crippling your walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it this way. There are two, two dimensions, if you will. Okay, the Old Testament and the New Testament need to be acquainted with them both. Okay? Two facets. There's more than that because the facets, the, the things of our God, we will never really know. It's going to take eternity and that's, that's still insufficient for us to truly know God as he truly, truly is, as we will even better so when we're in heaven. Okay? But we can know him as he is today in how he reveals himself unto us. It's going to be even better in heaven. See? And go to now to Exodus chapter 12, 
Verse 12, just one verse. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. One verse. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite... Uh, let's read um, 11 and 12, okay? And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, for with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. We're going to be reading this chapter here next. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the little g gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Remember in the book of Deuteronomy, our Lord says of Israel, it's because these nations are abhorrent in my sight, because they, they set up their little gods and they set up the idols in their heart. They're, they're uh, nations of idolatry. That's why I'm bringing you in and getting rid of them, not because of your own righteousness, see. Okay? And this judgment against Pharaoh and against the gods of Egypt. And oh boy, if you've ever looked into anything of Egypt, you know, Egypt, uh, the Egyptian gods, which are basically today the Roman Catholic saints. Okay? Yeah. See, God is a God of, ju of judgment. And his ways are beyond our own ways. His ways are not our ways. He knows how to make a point, doesn't he? And any of you have suffered the joy of his chastisement. Praise the Lord, huh? But see, okay, Esau was bitter because he, he messed it up and he knew it. And what was he doing? He was blaming someone else for it. Rightfully so, Jacob was to be blamed. But then again, never forget, Jacob didn't eat my pottage, did he? Esau, God hated Esau because Esau's God was his belly, was flesh. You get it? And the children of Israel were made bitter because they were oppressed by some hotshot who didn't know Joseph, I believe, didn't want to acknowledge or know Joseph. Okay? Cause of bitterness. Now, while we were in Exodus chapter 12, I went back there, back to uh, Exodus 1. Exodus chapter 12, we want verses 3 under verse 10. Okay? Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 under verse 10. Bitter. Okay? We kind of already addressed this with looking at uh, Exodus 15, verse 23, but we're going to touch it again. Okay, Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 on to verse 10. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take of them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or, or from the goats. God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Shall provide himself a lamb. So he was a sheep. He wasn't a goat. Hmm? And look at that. Your lamb will be without blemish, no sin. A male of the first year. He was the fur. He was uh, Mary's firstborn son. Firstborn, yes. Firstborn Catholic. Mary had other kids. Okay. Okay. And ye shall take it out from the sheep. Or from the goats, the sheep, sheep, signifying Israel. Okay, I had to put that in there. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. 
tie that in with the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ in the evening, the leaders of Israel were against him. Like uh, the high priest Caiaphas said, that it was more better for a guy to die for the nation, of, uh, for one guy die for the nation, or something like that, he said. Hmm? Yeah. Don't, don't miss the tie-ins here of the Passover with the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Don't miss that ever. Very, very rich in our instruction. Very rich. Very rich. Let's continue. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, boom, boom, and on the upper door post, boom, of the house wherein they shall eat it. There we go, a typology right there. Side, side, top, cross, okay? This doesn't mean they were looking toward the cross all the way back here. No, no. But there were types of it, absolutely. Come on. Side posts, top, blood, hello. They weren't looking forward to the cross because if they had, were looking forward to the cross, even uh, ignorant and unlearned, like that one, brother, ignorant and unlearned people uh, like Peter and stuff like that, but yet had been with Jesus, they would have at least known it's like, oh, Lord, I don't want to see you die, but I know you have to. So, but no, what did Peter do? This won't be. No, 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 Lord, don't go. You're not going to do this. What, and what did Jesus do? Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay, let's continue. Yes, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with Bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Bitter herbs. If you've never been to a, a Pesach, a, a Seder dinner, a Passover dinner, one of the things they do, they make this kind of like almost like bread pudding kind of thing uh, with apples and stuff like that to symbolize the mortar and stuff like that. But what they do is they, get, they give you a little thing of salt water. And you take a little piece of parsley and you dip it in the parsley into the salt water and you go like this at the Passover. It signifies the tears of the children of Israel uh, for their sighing in Egypt, crying for the Lord, save us. Okay, but that's some if you've never been to an authentic, real Passover dinner before, I, I would suggest recommend you do. And boy, what a witness it would be you of the church of the living God if you were to do that. Okay, if you were to do that. Because remember, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember, which is coming. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, that's something that they do with the bitter herbs. They take the parsley, dip it in the salt water, and go like this, and then you eat it. It is bitter, okay? But with bitter herbs. Hence, again, talking about bitter taste, okay? I wanted to, you know, wanted us to go through that first in Exodus, but we were looking at it here. But to remember the bitterness. To remember the bitterness, the bitter herbs, okay? Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And interesting enough, our Lord Jesus Christ at the Passover dinner, okay? The Lord's Supper, you know, that Catholics make the big to-do of everything, okay? And the comparison between the Passover and the crucifixion and the Lord's Supper. You know, communion is a time of what? Self-examination, okay? Self-examination, okay? But indulge me here a little with Wabbit, okay? Just a little Wabbit here. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 26. Just a little wabbit here, okay? Just a little wabbit. When you, when you allow bitter, bitter to be bitter, and bitterness spring up in you, you, you need to remember your place. You need to also remember that nine times out of ten, it's your fault. 
And if it isn't, like for example, certain things that happened to us recently, okay? It might have been brought about by certain actions, but the action in and of itself was beyond our control, okay? Hence, we were both made bitter by something that recently happened. My wife's hip went out of place again. It's the third time, okay? She's actually got to get it, her artificial hip replaced uh, again, okay? So she's got to get a replacement. But this happened again yeah, on Monday, and we were both pretty bitter about it, okay? The actual action of her hip going out of place wasn't by any strenuous action or anything. It just, just moved wrong or something, and it went out of place. So made bitter not by, some, by something that not necessarily was her physical fault. But it was a result. But because of that, we both were bitter. And in being bitter, we both were in bitterness. Okay? And see, the Passover, which was instituted for the children of Israel to do as a thing, as an ordinance in the Old Testament... It was necessary. Today in this dispensation, you don't need to do it for salvation. Not at all. It's not a requirement. It's a good thing for if you're Jewish, if you're a Hebrew. I, yeah, I've said to you before, celebrate the Passover. Absolutely. Don't confuse it with the Lord's Supper. Don't do that. They are similar. Okay. But if you're Jewish, Hebrew, absolutely. 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 Because they're both. Important things of remembrance of what God did for you. Okay? In the Old Testament, see, that's the thing. Passover, what the Lord did for the children of Israel with the Exodus. Today, in this dispensation, what he did for you, what he did for me. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 on to verse 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Verse 28. For this is my flesh of the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Died, buried, and rose again, third day according to the scriptures. Shed his blood to cleanse us of our sins. He had, his visage was so marred. His visage, his face was so marred. You couldn't even tell that you were looking at a man. A mangled mess was God our Father on the cross. Okay? And 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay? See, Catholics make the Lord's Supper. <laughs> I do that because what they call the Lord's Supper is not truly really the Lord's Supper. Okay, that's why I did that. Okay. Catholics taking something that's clearly defined in Scripture and twisting it to suit their own end. Catholic! Yea, hath God said. Oh boy! Imagine that! Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 under verse 31. Paul talking about this very thing, okay? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Remember. Remember. Okay? For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore... <laughs> Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What does verse 27 mean? Verse 28. But let a man examine himself. 
and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Mm. Examine himself. I think you know where we're going next, don't you? Hold your place here. You have to know. You have to know. If you've watched anything that the Lord has done through your servant, you have to know where we're headed. I, I, this, ha this happened to both of us. So this is fresh on our hearts, on our minds, sharing it with you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 on to verse 5. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of the flesh. <laughs> yeah. Though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your, your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you? Except ye be reprobates? See, the Lord's Supper, communion, is a time of self-reflection, self-examination. And you try to have communion with the Lord in sin? For he, verse 29 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Self-examination. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. Self-examination. It's not salvific. Like the Catholics tell you. That's why they make, that's why these coadjutors uh, make a big stink about flesh. Because they're Catholic. The, their mass is salvation. Among the many things that these poor Catholics have, to not even have a guarantee that they're saved. Okay? But see, time of remem remembrance, reflection. Very similar to the Passover. Not to be confused, okay? But see, the Passover was specifically for the children of Israel under the dispensation of the law that they were to receive, okay? See, that was the thing. And they were to do that in remembrance, okay? The Passover, they were given the law and they were to keep the Passover to remember that, hey, don't forget from whence you came! Brad, don't forget... From whence he came. Whatever your name is. Lady, ladies, sisters, don't, don't do that. But don't forget from whence you came. Don't do it. Why? Oh, that could lead to you being bitter. And if you're bitter, that could lead to bitterness. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I like my wabbit with hot sauce. Teriyaki is okay, but I, I prefer hot sauce. Hot sauce. Okay. <laughs> there is actually a hot sauce called Valentina, which, with beautiful irony, I enjoyed that hot sauce. That's one of my favorites. But anyway, dude, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. It, there is. There's a Valentina hot sauce. Okay. So, <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 21 on to verse 25. Bitter, to be bitter, that could lead to bitterness. Okay? Something that you do and mess up and might not be going back. Esau was bitter because of that. Bitter because of bondage. Something that not necessarily they that you did like a circumstance or something, stuff like that does happen. But see, there again, it could be the Lord proving you. Not that he doesn't know, but that you don't know. Okay, remember, Lord knows everything. You don't even know your own heart. Those of you who have been <laughs> saved for years and years and years, and years, you don't even know your own heart. You think you do. And if you think you do, then you're a fool. When the Lord is proving us in things, 
okay, proof, you know, proving us or letting us go through things. It's not that he can find out how we're going to react. Hi. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Hot shot. Hi, hot shot. Yeah. Hi. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 21 on to verse 25. Want to see another way that um, can put in you, get you bitter? Deuteronomy 32, verses 21 on verse 25. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. <laughs> And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Foolish nation. And I believe personally that verse 21 is talking a uh, reference about how sooner or later our Lord was going to graft us in, us Gentiles, that foolish nation. Foolish. Someone who a uh, foolish says in his heart there is no God. Someone who is foolish behaves as if there is no God. A foolish nation. Okay. You know, the Gentiles who drank uh, things out of skulls? Yeah. Look at the how Catholics in their catacombs dress up skulls with the... This is disgusting. It's disgusting. Yeah. Verse 22. For fire is kindled in mine anger. Reference unto the Holocaust. And shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase. And set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And remember, typology, mountains, okay? I believe mountains, people who are strong, <clears throat> grounded. Mountains, people, okay? Proud, stuck up, stubborn mountains that don't move. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. And I've shared with you before, you can look at these uh, videos on the channel here about the Holocaust. Uh, I totally believe 110%, and I've even discussed this with, um, with a few rabbis and uh, um, several people who are actually Jews, real Jews, okay? Okay, not the ones pretending to be high, okay? I believe that the Holocaust was God's judgment upon the Jew, okay? I really do. I really do. Because it fits. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay? I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of the serpents of the dust. Serpents of the dust, of the dust, and no marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of life, uh, light, and no marvel if his ministers are transformed. Into the ministers. Hmm. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. No discrimination. Young and old will be burnt up, destroyed. Why was this a bitter destruction? They have moved me to jealousy. With that which is not God. And, you know, that's the thing. Now, like I said, there are circumstances that can happen outside that will make, that can cause you to be bitter. But you don't have to be in bitterness about it. Because remember, no one's putting a gun to your head, right? There are things that can happen to you externally that can make you bitter. But you don't have to be in bitterness. Because remember, you've been set free, apparently. Is that going to happen? <laughs> no. I mean, we, we sin every day. I was in bitterness. My 
wife was in bitterness. There are some of you that are in bitterness right now. Because of certain things that have happened outside. And you know it. And you know too on upon whom shoulders that truly lies. You do know that. Hence, bitterness. See, <laughs> and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. We can be as mountains people and be so firm and so strong and so stubborn. And Lord knows how to make a point, doesn't he? But what happens? We as mountains, we're, we're just going to keep going on, right? Be strong and stern. Yeah. Then the unexpected happens. And you're not instant, out of season. And if someone who has been saved for a multitude of years says that they're instant in season and out of season all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they lie, they lie, and their breath stink. I think you know what we're, what we're talking about, don't you? And on this, on this, we're going to come back to Deuteronomy 32. Proverbs 5. <laughs> Yeah, Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5. Okay? You go against the Lord and things go to hell on you. There'll be a bitter destruction similar to Esau. Because, especially you coadjutor devils, you know. You know that you're serving Satan. You know. You know what you're doing. You know that you are going against Jesus Christ. You know. Okay, um, you, you guys are stupid, but you're not ignorant. Okay, you're stupid. You're pretty brilliant. You're very intelligent, but you're stupid. Ignorant, you can fix. You can't fix stupid. Okay? You can't fix stupid. Why are they stupid? Why are you calling them stupid? They've made their choice. Hence, a bit of destruction. Burning! Wow, imagine that! Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 13. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. My son, attend unto my wisdom. Attend unto the fear of the Lord that I will teach you. Do the scriptures and stuff. Okay? And what is our Lord saying? Job 28, 28. Thank you very much. Okay? And understanding. What does our Lord say in Job 28, 28? Thank you very much. Okay? That thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman, drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. I can't help it. I, I mean, th this is you, okay? I, we, you know, talked about the, this with them before. This is you, so. <laughs> but her end, her end is bitter as wormwood. Oh, and when it comes to wormwood, wormwood, Chernobyl, wormwood, hmm. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Hmm. The place here, as far as wormwood is concerned, go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Wormwood, bitter, wormwood, hmm. That hot sauce rising up, boy. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 16, on to verse 20. 
For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be any man, any, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart turneth away from his God, turn away, turneth away this day from, excuse me, from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And of course, we know in the book of Revelation, that star that's going to fall or something like that is called wormwood. And Chernobyl apparently does mean wormwood. Interesting, huh? Very interesting. Let's continue. And it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my own heart. You're going to be drinking. You're going to, you're going to be uh, serving yourself a good piece of wormwood there, buddy. Yeah. To add drunkenness. To thirst. Hmm. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. Smoke against that man. Okay. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Hmm. Blot out his name from under heaven. It doesn't say anything about blotting his name out of the book. Hmm. The books. What is it? The three books video? Back to Proverbs chapter 5. Okay. Verse 4 again. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Another reference on this. Lamentations. Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. Come on, work with me. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 14, on to verse 20. I was a derision to all my people, and their song all the day. Why? Lamentations. It's the lament, lamenting of how the Lord allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to come unto Jerusalem and wipe the snot out of them. When they were warned, they were warned, they were pleaded with, they were warned, they were warned, but they said, no, we're going to do what we're going to do. They're going to be planted like a mountain. He hath filled me with bitterness. Why? Oh, you read Lamentations. You talk about a bitter destruction, huh, boy? See? Do you see? Yes. He hath filled me with bitterness. Because of a bitter destruction? Because of what they had done? Yeah. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Interesting, huh? You lost devils. Your destruction is bitter. Hence, you're filled with bitterness. You're drunken with wormwood. Because you know what awaits you. You're not ignorant. You're, you're intelligent. You are. And I'm not just addressing you, dear friend. I know you all. All you devils think the world revolves around you, right? <laughs> the world revolves around you. Yeah. Right? You do. That's that's traits of you devils. Okay? But it's the truth. You're bitter because you know where you're going. And it ain't heaven. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. 
and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remember my, remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood twice and the gall. Huh. Wormwood, dear brethren, let's just know this. Wormwood is associated with what? God's judgment. Okay, number one, association. And number two, it's also associated with not going along with God's way. Now, we have the Church of the Living God. We have nothing to do with Wormwood. But, oh, boy. Oh, boy. There can be some things crashing down around us, right? When we stand strong as a mountain for the wrong things, for the things that, hello, we want... My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. And verse 21, we got to read, is something that through a repentance and broken... See, lamentations here. This, this is a broken man, Jeremiah the prophet, you know, broken over what he saw. He was in bitterness over what he saw. Jeremiah was righteous, but he was there when it happened. Hence, he was in bitterness because the bitter destruction, okay? He was lamenting for his people. He was in bitterness for them, okay? This I recall to my, to my mind. Therefore have I hope. He had hope. You devils, you have no hope. Except this is your life, your best life now, right? Sure is. <laughs> That's why told you seriously man I, I hope you guys I hope you guys do great I hope life is going well for you I hope you have the best that your life has to offer I hope you continue to rub it into people's faces because this is the best you're ever going to get Proverbs 5 again picking up at verse four, uh, 5 where we left off her feet go down to death her steps take hold on hell Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Shh, Brad, be quiet. <laughs> Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. You want your cake and eat it too. I wasn't planning on this. Well, so what? We have to expect the unexpected. And then when the unexpected comes, do we get bitter because it interferes with what we want? God proving? I'm doing a little proving? Think you know your own heart, huh? You don't. What you need to know about your own heart is that it's deceitful and desperately wicked. And see... You devils who say, God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. It's disgusting. And see, people who say that use it as a defense to justify their sin or to cover up sin. Usually it's to justify a sin that they just uh, did. Okay? One second, brethren. <laughs> Smoke alarm. My wife doing some cooking. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Verse 8. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Why? Verse 9. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy ears unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth. And thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Oh, but you're going to be, your spirit is saved, right? <laughs> hmm. And now go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. 
verses 31 on to verse 33 now. For their rock, lowercase r, is not as our rock, capital case r. Even our enemies themselves being judges. We've talked about this many times. You shall know them by their fruits. Look at their channels. Look at their, look at their ministries. Look at what they're preaching. Look at how they're living. What they're preaching. This false ecumenical gospel. These Christians in the buildings. Okay. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Yeah. That cup that's in the hand of Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism bitter. And those of you who have bowed your knees onto her, Satan, onto him and his church, mother church, you know, and work for her army, the Jesuits, you're in this bitter. Why? Their wine is the poison of dragons. Oh, like the red dragon? Don't say, huh? And now, okay, he saw. He was bitter and had bitterness. Why? Because he messed up and there was no going back. Children of Israel were uh, made bitter because of what? The, the bondage, okay? External, something that they couldn't really help, okay? But in that bitterness, their tears were unto the Lord. You choose another God. You choose to pass over God of all things. Choose your own way. Just like Esau did. Okay? But when it comes to someone being bitter, bitterness, we can't get away from Job. Oh, and Job. What can we say about Job? What, can, what, have, what have we not said about Job? Job in Scripture had a glowing review, if you will, from our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father himself. What did he say of Job? <laughs> Verse 8 in chapter 1. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and issueth evil? God said that of Job. And Satan's like, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? We're reading in Job chapter 1, verse 9. Okay? Verse 10. Hast, uh, hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Verse 11. But put forth thy hand, thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. It's like Satan's accusation. The accuser of the brethren, these devils, and these dark implant Christians. Okay? Yeah. He only cares about the stuff. Get rid of the stuff. He'll curse you to your face. Didn't work out for Satan that way, did it? No. But then again, Satan says, skin for skin, and that's in chapter 2, skin for skin, yay. All that a man has, he'll give for his life. But touch his bone and his flesh now, and he'll curse you to your face. And of course, the Lord allows Satan to do that. He said, don't kill him. So Satan goes out and just wreaks havoc on Job. And Job was an upright man, a perfect and upright man, one who feared God and eschewed evil. Twice that is said of Job by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Twice that is said by the Lord of Job. Twice. That's significant. 
So when it comes to Job chapter 3, verses 17, under verse 26, logically, okay, there was no sin for reason at all that the Lord allowed Job to go through this stuff. There was no, I mean, Job, our Lord, twice, twice said that of Job. But he allowed Satan to do that. He knew Job, what Job would do. He knew Job, what he was like, because he knew Job. Okay? So when it comes to this being bitter and having bitterness, Job chapter 3, verse 17 on verse 26. And again, being bitter by not anything that was of your own. That does happen. Okay? Okay? But you got to remember, there's no accidents. There are no coincidences. There are some things that will happen to you that has happened to me that we won't know until we're up there with the Lord. Why did that happen? What? 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 What, I, I, what did I do? I, you, what? I, I, I was innocent, Lord. Why did that happen to me? But see, there's always a reason. Nothing just ever happens. Coincidences don't exist. When you read the book of Job, you have to read the entire book in its entirety. You see why God allowed this to happen to him. But Job chapter 3, verses 17 on to verse 26. Check this out. The wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Wherefore is life given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul? Talking about himself. He was bitter in soul, kind of like Hannah. Which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures? which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. So, uh, obvi obviously, yes, Job was bitter. And Job wasn't in bitterness until, until, towards the end of the book of Job. Uh, Job chapter 23, just two verses here. Job chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Job chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. Why is this happening? What did I do? And in the case of Job, okay, God had a reason. Nothing just ever happens. Remember that, brethren. Coincidences do not exist. God allowed it to happen. God has his reason. Okay. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. His complaint was bitter. Why? Because he was going through something and he had no idea why. Okay. But see, you got to remember. Job's three friends who went to comfort him. And they'd done good for a while. But see, unfortunately, like it is with most of us, when someone is mourning, especially when they lose someone, um, some of the worst things you can do is open your pop, 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 pop. Sometimes you just got to shut up. Shut up. And be there for someone. Just look at them. Be there with someone. Sit next to them. Okay? But see, Job's three friends in their mouth and every single one of them brought and that well it must be your fault it must be your fault and logic says action reaction yes 
So it must be your fault. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Especially in the case of Job. But God had his reasons. God had his, God had his purposes. Okay? He did. But see, Job's three friends, just like Satan, nine, 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 accusing, 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 accusing. You did it. It's your fault. Now, those three friends of Job, they nod at him. Job was responsible for his own actions. But see, because of that bitterness, because he was bitter, and his three friends helped the matter, didn't force Job, but didn't help the matter. Job, you read in chapter 31, you actually see bitterness in Job chapter 31. When Job's like, oh, I've done this, I've done this, me, 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 me. So, in being in bitter, being bitter, bitterness came out. And in that bitterness, what did Job do? He exalted himself. And then, after Eli, the little whippersnapper, the young whippersnapper, spoke up. Then after that, God's like, okay, y'all, that's enough. Who is this who openeth, openeth his mouth? without words, without knowledge. Addressing Job. And then, after all that, because, because after what Job went through, you read chapter 31, that's bitterness. That's bitterness in Job. Because he was bitter. His complaint was bitter. Job 1 and 2. God allowed it to happen. Joe, God twice said of Job, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. You can't get a better testimony than, uh, than that from God himself. But it was of Job who was allowed to go through this. And by chapter 31, that kind of said nine, wasn't their fault. Job did not have to be like that. He did not have to resort to that. Okay, they were, they had fault, yes, but the fault that Job, instead of sticking to his guns, no, what did he do? He turned it and de decided to boast himself in his suffering. I, 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 I. Isn't it weird that when you're in suffering because of what you've done, you tend to want to bring out your accomplishments? And talk about what you have done. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? And of course, at the end of it all, at the end of it all, what was Job's response? After the Lord's like, okay, you're questioning me? Gave him over, what, 150 questions? Okay. What was Job's after it was all said and done, what was Job's final response unto the Lord? Job 42, verse 6. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Hmm. Verse 3 in Job chapter 42. Who is, the, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. God already knew that Job was a perfect and upright man, one who feared God and eschewed evil. But see, the prolonged thing that he went through, chapter 31, okay? He was bitter because of what he was going through. It resulted in bitterness. And in that bitterness, he boasted himself. And that's when the Lord's like, whoa, wait a second. Now I got God to come in. You see? And then, of course, you can talk about Jonah. My man Jonah. God said, go preach to the Ninevites. I ain't going. Yes, you are. Goes and gets swallowed up by a big, uh, big fish, puked up on land. It's like, go. It's like, okay. 
So Jonah goes, you know the story? He goes and preaches to the those of Nineveh and they, they repent. And then when they repent, God himself's like, okay, they're turning from their stuff. I'm not going to destroy them now. Okay? And where's Jonah? It's like, oi vey! <laughs> I, Lord, I, I knew you were going to do this. Okay? This is why I, I went this way. You know, I, I did because I knew you're merciful. Jonah was bitter because the Lord said, go preach to them. He didn't want to do it. Okay? Then things happen. He did it. And then God, who is merciful, who would much rather be merciful, spared them at that time. Okay? At that time, God spared them. And then, Joe, and then Jonah, in bitterness, it's like, ha ha! And the thing about the gourd, you know? Brought up gourd. And let's go there instead of just going off of this. Uh, let's go there. Jo uh, uh, Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. <laughs> you know, and to kind of cool off Jonah, our Lord made a gourd grow up, you know, and Jonah was all happy about the gourd. Then the Lord smoked the gourd, okay? Hmm. Jonah chapter 4, verse 9. And Jonah was really mad. Really mad about the gourd. Jonah was mad. He had an it mad. Insane. Excuse me. He was angry. He was bitter. And because he was bitter, he had bitterness. Verse 9 on verse 11 in Jonah chapter 4. God said to Jonah, Do us not well to be angry? Not mad. I use mad. Excuse me. Do us not well to be angry for the Lord? A little bitterness here, Jonah. And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. <clears throat> Mountain. Burning at the bottom up. Then said the Lord, little, little, feeble, finite man. Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, Neither made it to grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? <laughs> Jonah, oh boy, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Bitterness. Mm. Brethren, you need to watch out for being bitter. And what we have seen thus far, now there are circumstances that can be around you, but a majority of it, being bitter is the result of what? Things not going according to the way you plan, or things going the way it happens because you messed something up. Psalm 64. Psalm 64. Psalm 64. Verses 1 on to verse 4. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue, wet, W-H-E-T, sharpened, okay? Who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows. Even bitter words. Yeah. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Yeah. That they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him. Fear not. Bitter words. Oh. How do bitter words come about? Oh, sometimes when we're angry, when we had our little tootsies stepped on, or you drop a couch on your toe. 
or the Lord tells you, uh, don't do that. I'm going to do it. Don't do that. Other, hey, hey, go, go, hey, hey, man, I, maybe you shouldn't do that. I'm going to do it. Okay. Love you. Don't what happened. But bitter words. Bitter words. Hmm. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers, workers of iniquity, workers of iniquity, using bitter words. Mm. Not like I've never in, uh, encountered that. And unfortunately, I have used bitter words myself. So have you. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. Verses 9 and verse 11. Bitter words. Fools make a mock at sin. But among the righteous there is favor. The heart knoweth his own bitterness. And a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown. But the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Ooh, look at verse 10. The heart knoweth his own bitterness. Why is that? Because fools make a mock at sin. And the fool says in his heart there is no God. And if you're a fool, you're in your heart you say there is no God. And that will act, lead you to act foolishly. But see, the heart knoweth his own bitterness. Yeah, God sure does know your heart. Yeah. And you're in bitterness. Why? Because your, your end is bitter as wormwood. Your end is bitter as wormwood. So, you're bitter. Any of you lost people, you're bitter. You're bitter. Permanently bitter, <laughs> it seems. And that leads into bitterness. And the heart does know his own bitterness. And only a fool thinks he knows his own heart. And only a fool trusts his own heart. James, of course, you knew we were going here. James chapter 3. Brethren, this is something that I myself have failed at and have sinned in lately, okay? Um, there's no excuse for it. There's no excuse for it. But when you go outside of what our Lord wants or you put your desires... And what you want above what our Lord wants causes you to be bitter, which will result in bitterness. Why? Because you're not getting your way. Or something can happen around you that you're not expecting. Okay? Totally, it's like, didn't do anything to bring it on. Like what happened Monday. But yet that interferes with our little pettiness, our little penny, petty kingdoms that we want to establish, right? Our own little things that we want to do. You know, I've always stood by about always be expected, be instant in season, out of season. But see, not everybody can do that high 24 hours a day, seven days a week. James chapter 3, verses 8 to verse 16. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Bitter words. <laughs> From a bitter heart, filled with bitterness. Yeah. Why? Because you didn't get your way? Or you done messed up and can't fix it? Or something has happened around you that you couldn't control. And instead of sticking to, though he slay me, 
Yet will I trust in him. You know, that the trial of your faith is more precious. You know, why? Because the trial of your faith worketh what? Oh, come on, say it. Say it. Come on, say it. Patience. Patience. I know that hurts to say, doesn't it? Hmm. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Spirit, soul, and body. We have a video, I've done a video where we discussed that. I'll put it in the description box, okay? <laughs> Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. We slip. We make mistakes. Unless your name is David Daniels. <laughs> we slip. We make mistakes. Things happen. Yes, they happen. But when you come across these Christians who have no problem with profanity, with cursing, not just profanity, but cursing, sending you death threats, Nothing happens to your wife. I really hope nothing happens to you at the great white throne of judgment. But, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. This is true. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man um, in, and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Note the differences of knowledge and wisdom there. Okay, note that. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Bitter envying. Brethren, you know why these devils are so bitter and in bitterness and so fierce? Because they want what we got and they can't have it. Because they don't want to go to the Lord on his terms. No, they want to boot the door out of the way and go up their own way. They want to boot the door out of the way and set up their own little pagan idols and worship them. They want to boot the door out of the way. And worship man. They want to boot the door out of the way. So that they can do things they want to do. On that very day. My brethren. Verse 10. These things ought not so to be. And you got to remember, Job was bitter. But granted, constant lashing, not at gunpoint, but that being bitter eventually did lead him into bitterness. Okay? And this we have to remember. This we have to remember. Verse 15 and 16. This wisdom descendeth not from above. Because Christ, when he suffered, he didn't threaten. When he was reviled, he didn't fight back. Okay? He didn't. That's not talking against self-defense. Okay, remember? Okay, we, we, we addressed this in the previous video. Okay, about these pacifist Satanists. Okay? Okay. But our Lord didn't revile. Okay, 
when we are persecuted, we bless, we tell them the truth, okay? But if someone's going to attack you to try to kill you, put up your dukes and defend yourself, okay? Absolutely. Beware of pacifism, okay? But remember, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is, but is what? Earthly, sensual, devilish. What? What is that? Which is earthly, sensual, devilish? Oh, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. That's why some of you should have kept your big mouth shut and not boast your blessings, but rather the blessor. Why? Oh, unbeknownst to some, but that could uh, have caused some to have bitter envying. And verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. We both wanted our day on Monday to do, you know, to do what we wanted to do. The Lord had a different plan. It's proving time to ourselves. Watch out for being bitter, brethren. Watch out for being bitter. And we got to remember this admonition. We have got to remember this admonition. Go to Isaiah chapter 5, of course. Of course. Of course. We're, we're going to mess up. We're going to fail. You're going to sin. Repent and get right with the Lord. Don't stay here where the devils want you to stay. Move forward. Okay? Okay? Don't forget this. Isaiah chapter 5. Verses 20 on to verse 25. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The Lord chastened us, correct us, so that we may know him even more so and love him even more so. Because he revealed in us that, hey, guess what? You too. <laughs> See that you can have joy in. Let's continue. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. I can handle it. I'm doing good. I can handle this stuff. Ah. I can be a little self-sufficient. <laughs> Good luck, pal. Yeah. Yeah. God forbid. Which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Mm. What reward is it? Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. You hearing that? Okay. And despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And, okay, 
So we've seen some of the things that can cause one to be bitter. And things that can cause things to be bitter can lead into bitterness. And bitterness, as we have seen, hmm, hmm, Esau just find himself. Job. Jonah. But you can you you realize though when people turn away from God and reject the truth for so long and hearts get hardened, not only can a people, a person, spirit's own body, be bitter, but that can also transcend and be a nation. Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 11. Is there such a thing as a bitter nation? Someone bless America. Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 11. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And then, of course, you look at uh, King Hezekiah, how when the ambassadors from Babylon came and he, you know, in his chutzvah, it's like, hey, look at everything. Look at how I've been blessed. And, of course, what happened? The envy, bitter, they wanted what they had. And because of judgment, the Chaldeans, a bitter nation, mm, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Don't, don't pass over that, okay? Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves, even though they were a hammer in the hand of our God. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar was his servant. Nebuchadnezzar is up there right now. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to, the, to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand, and they shall scoff at the kings. Yeah. And the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold. For they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change. And he shall pass over and offend. Imputing this his power unto his God. Verse 7. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their God. Mm, unto his God. Little G. Oh, I wonder who that's a reference to, huh? A better nation. America is a better nation. Americans seem to be full of bitterness. Except when you see these prosperity nitwits people and these Tony Robin devils, you know, wanting just to rub in your face about how great they are and how much money they have and all their stuff that they got and they want to rub it in your faces. And that's especially abhorrent from Christians. I can't stand that. Okay? Talk to me of the Lord and his mercies towards you. But keep your blessings to yourself, please. Tell me, tell me, the Lord has had mercy on me. He gave me this blessing. Praise him for what he has done for me. But don't twist it and say, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Oh, because the Lord, but look at this, look at this. No, like, look at the Lord, look at the Lord, look at the Lord, look at the Lord. See what the Lord has done? See, he, because you look at the Lord, you see, he does this. You don't twist that around. 
That's disgusting. Oh, can't stand that. But a bitter nation. There is such a thing as a bitter nation. So, bitter. Bitter. Okay? A bitter nation. Why? Because they want what you got. These people with bitter words, these devils, who are envy, bitter envying. Why? Because they want what we got. They want the Lord, but they don't have Him. They have that. They have that. And these devils, certain of them, they know that. Hence, in bitterness. But we as the church of the living God, we can have our own way. We, can, we think we have our own things to do. We want what we want. As the church of the living God. See that, that spirit reverse flesh thing again? huh? And then the Lord allows the circumstance to happen. Then you get your toes stepped on. Because things aren't going the way you want it to go. Got to watch out for being bitter. Why? Because that will lead to bitterness. That will lead to bitterness. This thing about wanting what the other has so that they may glorify themselves. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Verses 13 under verse 24. Shimon, sorcerer. When Philip came, Shimon the sorcerer, he was, he was making himself to be some great one. Then comes Philip preaching Jesus. Then people turn from Shimon, turn to the Lord. But Shimon, the sorcerer guy, he didn't like that. So what did he do? He infiltrated. Verse 13, under verse 24. Then Shimon himself believed also. And these nitwit devil, easy believism people want to tell you that Shimon, this guy, was actually saved because he believed. Watch out for easy believism. Whether it's uh, easy believism in the course of that you save yourself by your belief, you know, boot the door and save yourself by your belief, or you boot the door out of the way and save yourself because you just call without being broken or contrite or having any fear of the Lord. Okay, beware of that. But then Shimon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, oh, oh it's looking good for him. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Shimon saw that through laying on, the, uh, laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So he was dethroned. People were looking to them. So he's like, okay, I got to see what these guys are doing so I can get in on this and puff myself up again. So this, obviously, this Shimon guy, you think he was a little bitter because he was dethroned by God? Oh, oh yeah, brethren. You think you're some great one, right? Hi! I, I tell you all the time, I have a pride problem. Yeah? And I think I'm a great one because I get to do what I, you know, hey, so long, yeah, right? We want to do what we want to do, right? Then the Lord orchestrates something. It's like, no, you're going to check this out. Getting a little too full of yourself. I want to watch this. But see, Shimon, he was dethroned. And he went for all the wrong reasons. This Shimon guy was not saved. No way. No way. Okay? Why? He offered them money when he saw that. 
Okay, he saw that. He wanted to do that too. So people would go back to him and look at him as some great one. Let's continue. Verse 19, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Gave himself away. Verse 19, verse 20, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because, that, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Why? For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God. You pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Yeah, he was in bitterness. Why? Because he was bitter, because he lost his position. He lost his swagger, so to say. More proof that he was lost? Absolutely. Then answered Shimon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me. I'm not going to go to him. No, you do it for me. See, if this Shimon guy were really saved, how do you explain verse 24? Help him with prayer. No. No. Because he wasn't saved. And then answered Shimon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So Shimon was bitter because he was dethroned and in bitterness because he wanted what they had. And his heart wasn't right because he didn't fear God. He only saw something that could benefit him as far as his status and stuff like that. Watch out for bitter, being bitter. You also got to watch out for being in bitterness. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verses 9 on to verse 18. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before both we... Before we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Yes. Here's where it gets really stinging. And here is what we need to remember. When you start thinking a little too proud of yourself. When you start letting yourself, you know, hurting yourself by patting yourself on the back. Then along comes bitter. Then along comes bitterness. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's me. That's you. Our righteousness is not ours. It's imputed righteousness by him who died for us. If you've forgotten that, I'm here to tell you, brother, sister. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way have peace have they not known. Why? There is no fear of God before their eyes. And unfortunately, brethren, you and I as the church of the living God, we can do exactly that. You and I can do exactly uh, whatever these lost people can do. The difference is we have the fear of God before our eyes. The difference is when we mess up, oh, the Lord chastens us. But see, our enemies being judges themselves, their rock is not our rock. And their, their judgment and their dignity proceeds forth from themselves. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verses 28 on to verse 32. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, retain God in their knowledge, knowledge comes from what? Wisdom. Wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. But yet they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. Hmm. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Okay? And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all un unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And brethren, let's be real with each other. Let's be real. Any one of us at the Church of the Living God, today even, can fit ourselves somewhere within that, can't we? Wherefore, let him who thinketh, thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I don't see a gun at your head, right? This is our life in Christ, brethren. That struggle. And there are some out there who won't talk to you about these things on a level as though they are have done it themselves. Because remember, they're like Shimon. They have that place of prominence. And yes, the Lord will give victory over sin, yes. But when you pass off that you don't yourself struggle. I struggle just like you do. I struggle worse sometimes. I am a sinner who is chief. Some of you just say, oh, you're right, Brad, you're, you're a worse sinner than I. Yeah. I think you, with that statement and that attitude, I think you're shooting yourself in the foot. Or at least I don't do, ah. Hop along, Cassidy. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We've looked at causes to be bitter. And what brings about bitterness? What's our answer? Number one, the answer is our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. You're not saved. You have no hope. But for us at the Church of the Living God, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 on to the close of this chapter. We're almost done. <clears throat> this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding departing from evil, darkened, being as the world, worldling, hmm. being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, not their eyes, but of their heart, hmm. who being past feeling have given themselves over, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, put off. Remember, God ain't forcing you. Neither is Satan. 
You have the choice. Are you going to choose? Are you going to make the right choice? Or are you going to choose yourself? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, other than. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry. Sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Oh, we have failed at that. Both my wife and I have failed at that. Letting the sun go down upon your wrath. Going to bed angry. Neither give place to the devil. When you're angry and you sin in your anger, you're giving place to the devil. And when you're angry and or bitter, the devil's right there to just take you on. Kind of like Job's three friends. Time to give place to the devil. Remember, after what happened to Job, I abhor myself and repent of dust and ashes. Don't forget that. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We already looked about bitter words. And bitter words brought about by what? Oh, envying by these devils. But what happens when we of the church of the living God Use bitter words ourselves. Bitter words. Church of the living God, I repent of my bitter words that I have spoken. Forgive me. And forgive me for my bitterness. Because why? This is a time and a place under heaven for everything. Yes, there's a Read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1, under what? Verse 9, I believe it is. Okay? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, you're sealed. Once saved, always saved. But when you choose to give yourself over to this and are bitter which leads to bitterness you grieve the Holy Ghost which and the Lord is that spirit and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And of course, this is in context amongst those of the church of the living God. Okay? And the one that you have probably have been waiting for, Hebrews 12, verses 9 on to verse 17. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. 
Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness, being other than, separate than that. Now no chastening for the present time, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Whereby, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. For straight, for narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. For broad is the way that leadeth unto this, to destruction. Okay? And make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Right there, buddy. And therefore many be defiled. Bitterness defiles you. And when you allow bitterness in your heart, number one, you got to realize you're bitter. Whatever it is, you didn't get your way. Something happened around you and you were bitter about it, but that turned into bitterness. And what is that root of bitterness? I want to do what I want to do. Or you've gotten out of the way of our Lord's desire for you. You've gotten away from the scripture, walking outside of scripture. Something happened about you that you don't know what it's about. And as far as you know, it hasn't been revealed to you or whatever. As far as you know, it's not something you've done. But yet, why, why is this happening to me? Oh, this, oh, and then what happens? that could lead to you to being bitter and being in bitterness and being like Job and exalting yourself in your bitterness? Because like I said, you read uh, Job chapter 31. Okay. Job, after all he went through, finally in bitterness started, well, I'm this, I'm this, I don't deserve this. And even God himself said that of him. But see, Job went to bitterness and because of bitterness what happened it defiled him why because he boasted himself Elihu's out of those three guys Elihu's the young whippersnapper yes his his little thing was more accurate than they but it still had the same problem it pointed the finger at Job So you young whippersnappers who are patting yourselves on the back or getting pats on your head, uh, you need to take care. You need to beware. Okay? Pride in some of you young whippersnappers, boy. Oh, man. And, and, and look at verses 16 and 17 here. Look who our Lord brings up. Appropriate. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, granted, you got to remember here in the book of Hebrews, this is written for who? The Hebrews during the, for the Hebrews during the time of Jacob's trouble, written for a different dispensation, doctrinally, it's for that time. There are things that cross dispensational lines for us today. Yes, there's things we can get out of it, but we've got to remember that. There are things that you can mess up as the church of the living God, and 
God will be like, okay, you've, you've blown it. It's time to go on to something else. Like the children of Israel, okay? They eventually went into the promised land, but that generation in Numbers chapter 13, I believe that is. But that generation had to be wiped out because what? The Lord's like, okay, see that? You see that? Go get it. I'll be with you. Go get it. I'm with you. You'll get it. I'm with you. But no, they didn't. They didn't believe him. Didn't believe he was going to do what he said he was going to do. Okay? And you can run into something where you have a chance where the Lord has given you something and if you mess it up one time, it's over and done with. And there's no use crying over it. You have to accept it and move on. A lot of people can be bitter, but you don't have to be in bitterness. How do you do that? Humility. <laughs> Humble yourselves for the Lord, that he may lift you up in due time. Submit yourselves unto the Lord. Okay? That's, that's the only answer. Because... When something doesn't go your way, you can get bitter. You can be envious because you want to do what you want to do. You want to do what you think is edifying unto the Lord or is godly or is what he would want you to do. But then he intervenes. It's like, no, you need a little reality check there, Brad. Praise the Lord for it. Be on your guard, especially in these times, especially with what you are going to be seeing coming upon us. Be on your guard of being bitter. Be on your guard of bitterness. What is the answer to it? We already looked at it, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's see. Like I always tell you, you got to make the right choice. And how do you make that right choice? Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. I know, it would be great, wouldn't it, if the Lord would force us sometimes, right? Hello, hi. Oh, wouldn't that be beautiful, right? But then again, what would, you'd be a robot. And God wants you to choose the right things. That's why it's never going to be at gunpoint. Because our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, wants a genuine love from you. He wants your obedience. But what good is obedience today in this dispensation without the fear of the Lord, without that love of Him? And how can you love Him unless you fear Him? How can you fear him unless you've come to him broken of that self-righteousness of yours? I can try it. That's going to be it for this video. Um, I know we chased a little wabbit there, but uh, like I said, this, this, this came from something that happened with us recently. And... Um, had to share this with you. Beware of being bitter. Beware of bitterness, brethren. You can be angry, but don't sin. And if you do sin, oh, realize that you are giving place to the devil. It's not a sin to be angry. It's a sin to <laughs> do something against scripture in that anger. Yes, you can be angry. It's not a sin to be, be angry. What you do with that anger, in that anger. It's not a sin to be bitter. What do you do with that bitter? Bitter. 
And as we've seen, being in bitterness Uh, Esau his bitterness sin Job his bitterness in verse in chapter 31 I therefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes Jonah I hope this helps some of you I hope this helps you. I hope this edifies some of you. I hope the Lord is glorified through this because the Lord, like I said recently, allowed us to go through some stuff and it was very humbling and we needed to be reminded of just how frail we truly are. Remember how truly frail you are. And... Yeah, we, we need to be instant in season and out of season. But you know what, brethren? Our Lord at any given moment can allow anything to happen. And you think you're ready for anything. And then something happens that you weren't ready for. And then you, you sin. And you, let, you choose to be in bitterness. And in bitterness, all kinds of dumb things happen. And, uh, beware. Beware. Don't get too high on yourself there, boy. Because I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If you're anything of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're any of His, He's going to cut you down. And bring you down a couple of notches. If not, you're just going to get higher and higher and higher. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Love you. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for all that you do and for your prayers. We pray for so many of you. Thank you so much for watching if you do.